So I'm a clinical nurse specialist, so my role at Duke is actually I coordinate care for um, you found out before, Liam, families um, expecting a child that would need anything from cardiac surgery to brain surgery to back surgery. So I work with um, a large number of families. Um, but with the diaphragmatic hernia piece, um, one of the things that we have found is um, if you are a family and when you get this diagnosis, um, if you... Um, sorry, I'm a little bit lost without my slides because I'm not a general um, speaker for folks. Um, that when you get the news, it's really helpful to have someone as a touch point, especially if you're in a big healthcare system like you. Um, you don't know which, which office you go to, how do you get transportation from one place to the other. Um, a lot of the families that we do work with are actually from rural areas inside of North Carolina. We do have families from other states as well. Um, but one of the things that we um, have me there primarily at Duke is to, to walk the families through and to hold their hands. So I'm going to see if I can figure out a little bit about how this works. So most of you know and have seen several images of babies with the diaphragmatic hernia. Um, so my role prenatally is to have direct access for the families to me. So I have a private phone um, at Duke as well as my email address and, of course, pagers. So with that, we have a quick availability of a second opinion. So we actually get a lot of families who've actually been evaluated at large healthcare systems and either don't qualify, they can't get insurance to cross over to another state, or they just don't really want to be that far away. So we have a, um, a congenital diaphragmatic hernia website linked in our Duke website, and on that is my direct number as the coordinator, so families can contact me directly. And we can get you in for a quick um, second opinion. Um, and so my role is actually obtaining all of the prenatal records from all the various places that the families have been, and then getting families linked in for those appointments at Duke. And we have a protocol that we follow. We do um, an MRI while you're still pregnant. We wanna look at the baby a little bit more closely as far as the lung volumes and what to expect. It's like someone earlier talked about the diaphragm having agenesis, so not even being there. We would like to know that if we can before the baby's born so we can be a little more prepared. Um, we also will accept outside images, especially if we, so a lot of families, for example, may go to CHOP and have an MRI and a fetal echo, so looking at the baby's heart, but then they come to Duke and the mom's like, the last thing I want to do is set an MRI machine for another hour. Please tell me you're not going to make me do that again. So um, we've actually worked very closely with CHOP in the last several months, and we have a direct um, access to get the images pretty quickly, so our teams can see those, um, those images before the appointment is preferred, but definitely before you um, come in for delivery. Um, and then we also have two large multidisciplinary meetings. So one meeting we talk about all the families who are gonna come in and deliver and what, what their babies have going on and what to expect and how to take care of them. And then the other uh, meeting is specific to CDH families. And we started the second meeting sometime I'd say in the last year. And what we found out is we have our pediatric radiologist in the room that can actually go over the MRI images from whatever institution those images came from to give us a little bit more details about what to expect. And as several people have mentioned today, a lot of the appointments prenatally, meeting with neonatology, meeting with the perinatologist or um, maternal fetal medicine team, and then meeting the pediatric surgeon, pediatric cardiology with the fetal echo. And then we also on our team have our pediatric critical care team and our quality of life team. So a lot of folks ask about the quality of life. So that team, we do not call that a palliative care team at Duke. Our quality of life team actually looks at the whole quality of life for that child. So they look at, you know, what if the siblings need to come in and, or we want to have the, the grandmother come in, we have these strict restrictions because it's flu season. What can we do? Or what, what might be, maybe we need to check ladies' levels of a particular hormone that, so it's looking at a wide range of what other things may be. So it's not necessarily when the quality of life team comes something's going to happen with the baby. We really want to make sure we've gotten everything and we get the full picture and it's nice to have another team um, <clears throat> to look at things. And then we have genetics on our team. Um, and so the, the purpose of genetics is, uh, as you know, is, is talking to the families about drawing cord blood at delivery if, say, mom didn't want any of the testing done prenatally. And then a lot of times we have um, a, what we call a DNA extract and hold. So we actually hold some of the blood sample from the cord. Um, Right now, we don't have a specific time frame of how long we hold that DNA extracted hold, but we do hold that until we can have someone come in from genetics and evaluate the baby if there's something, especially if there's multiple things going on other than just the, um, the diaphragmatic hernia. 
And so my role with the team is um, making sure, say, if mom lives right around the corner and she says, I really would prefer to have spontaneous labor, a lot of times we talk with the family, we would prefer to have a scheduled induction of date and time, so we all as a team know and are prepared. Um, but also, if the family is very adamant about that, then we work with the family about having spontaneous labor and being close by. Um, we, I work with a lot of the hospitals across the state, so if you were, the family were to deliver at an outside small rural hospital, waiting until the baby is stable enough and then transferring in to do. Um, a lot of times the family will call me and say, hey, I went to the ER last night, I'm still in the hospital, and there have been times where I haven't received or my team hasn't received even a call that the patient was in the hospital. So sometimes it's hunting down the right person, tracking them down and saying, ship mom to us now, don't wait until after she delivers. Um, so. Um, I've served as a primary contact for the families um, for eight years now. I've been a nurse for 22, but I've been at Duke for about eight. Um, and I, actually this morning I had a mom who actually texted me my, to my cell phone, and uh, I deleted it thinking it, was a, uh, thinking it was a crazy message. I hit something here. And uh, I found her email in my old email account, and I just res had a response back from her. I said, by any chance, was this you who sent me a random text at 6 a.m. this morning wanting to just say hey? And she was, yeah, just wanted to say hey and what was going on in your life. So um, I, I, I hang out with these families for a while. Um, so postnatally, we talked about um, we have certain protocols, but one of the things that I think that makes the most, um, is most meaningful is we have a sonographer who will do the, the echo. And we have the most experienced sonographer do that so that we don't have someone who's taking forever to get the images. So we want to minimize the amount of time that we're doing the echo. So we have the most experienced sonographer there. And then, of course, I do have an immediate availability of um, ECMO. And then family-centered care participating in rounds and decision-making. So we actually have our families. We have rounds every day. Um, for every baby in our NICU, and then we do invite the families to participate. So we want to be able to hear from you. It's like someone said earlier, you know, my baby's doing this slightly different that, you know, he or she hasn't been doing. And a lot of times when you're at the bedside and it's you and your baby, you're looking at the, the, the simple thing, maybe not simple, but you're looking at the slight changes that maybe someone, um, someone may not pay as much, much attention as you as the, as the parent. Um, the other thing is the discharge care. So we have a 24-7 pager availability for the first year. Um, after that, of course, we provide care, but it's really nice that at 3 o'clock in the morning, if you have something going on, you can pick up the, the phone and call someone who carries a pager 24-7 um, to answer questions. We also have a transitions program, which um, a lot of people talk about that being a medical home. And basically, it's the baby at home with you, but it's a transitions program so that we can work with the families um, with a little bit more detail um, uh, as far as, like, the follow-up care. Sorry, I'm trying to find a couple of my notes. I coordinate everything on the prenatal side, so I don't know as much on the postnatal side. So the transitions home, um, anybody who has a little one for, that has uh, complex problems um, and dependent on, even on like ventilators, which we would not typically send a baby with a CTH with a ventilator home, um, but in other situations we have, but also baby, a baby who needs com comprehensive care um, and they just need a touch point coming in for like developmental um, concerns or, or developmental follow-up, I should say. So that is in the first year we have a transitions program to make sure the families, the babies transitioned well from Duke to, to home. And then we have a special infant care clinic that actually follows our um, kiddos for the first three years um, as far as like nutrition, feeding, physical therapy, um, and speech therapies, um, mainly looking at child development. So, and one of the things I heard today several folks said is after the first several years, then who, who follows up with these kiddos, which was a good point, where's the, the long, some of the long-term um, follow-up. And so at Duke, we have two research studies, and I have to say I am not a researcher and I'm not directly involved with the research, um, but we do have a study that's uh, called a Milrinone study, and so it's approved by the FDA for short-term use in adults with heart failure. And so what we're looking at is how does milrinone work to help the heart and lungs give oxygen to the, to the organs? So as you all know, um, if the baby is not being 
not having enough oxygen or having the oxygen levels enough high enough, then the baby would your baby would go on ECMO or heart lung bypass. And so what we're looking at is if we administer milrinone, does that increase the oxygen or help the heart and lungs to give oxygen to the other tissues? And so it's a double-blinded study, which means you as the family, nor do the researchers, the research coordinators, or the physicians involved. We don't know if it's actually like a sugar water or if it's actual melanome, so that we have, which is basically your, your best type of research study you can have. So no one really knows who, which baby is getting what and then to see how the baby responds. So we do talk to the families about the study, and of course, no is always an appropriate answer for any research study. And in some cases, we do I talk to the families that we may use milrinone if we feel like it is best in the clinical care. So in other words, we're not gonna withhold that if we think that's gonna be the best for, for the baby. And then the other study is an um, observational study. So it's multi-center, multinational um, observational registry. And so it was started in 1995 with over 3,500 children in the database, 90 centers in 10 countries. It made me wonder, um, Dawn, if this is one of the same registries or if it's a different registry. So they collect and analyze info um, information with the hope that they can uh, look at the history of CDH and then identify appropriate interventions. And Dr. Uh, Jennifer Peterson is uh, a neonatologist at Duke, but is also our principal investigator on both of our CDH uh, research studies. Um, and so my primary role is with the families is to let them know that we have two studies going on at Duke, um, one being the, the actual clinical trial study with um, Bill Renault, and then if the family wants additional information, I can give them a brochure, and then I can also coordinate them meeting with the, with the research coordinator teams for those research studies. So, any questions? I think that's the CDH study group, and they actually reached 10,000 patients last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. For the observation group? Or for the Miller and one? Observation group. How long has that medication been, um, I know it said that it was FDA approved for adults for yes, short term. Do you know anything more about I that? I don't. I don't know, um, again, because I don't work directly with the research uh, team. I don't know how long. I know Dr. Jennifer Peterson used milrinol for, fam for kiddos with CDH in the, her previous role before she came to Duke, but I'm not sure of, of the details. I guess not. I, the other day I saw um, somebody being a part of that study, and that was the first time that I've ever heard that medication used in the yeah. day was the second time. I would so I say at, at Duke, we, I'd have to be afraid to guess, but I would say, I mean, the study's been maybe a year, two years. It's not been a long-term study for sure. It's been very recent that we've started. Have you guys noticed any um, advert? Have you had any um, indication about how it, how it's working so far? Um, I honestly, I'm, I am not sure. If you wanted to email me, I'm happy, and I can see, you know, if they have any of the data they collected. I mean, I don't know that... We see on average maybe nine to 15 patients at Duke per year um, with uh, CDH. So it's not gonna be a large number at this point being recently started study. It's sounding like it's just listening to everybody talk at the conference, that that's pretty across the board. Yeah, it's a shame. There's something that we're working on that we're not public with right now. So when we, when we can talk more about that, we will. It would be great. That would be great if it was a big insurance for the survivors, because half of them would survive. That's why it's extremely important for our survivors to be a part of the research <laughs> database that we're doing, so that we can present these sorts of things to the universities and collaborate with the clinics and insurance companies and, and all the big studies. So cannot reiterate enough how important it is for everyone to be a part of all the research. 
Any other questions for me? You said that um, if you have a child on a ventilator, they don't go home. Should they stay in the hospital? With a documented hernia. I don't. I, I, I may be speaking out of turn because, again, I'm prenatal and my background is obstetrics and labor and delivery. So I may be speaking out of turn. I don't know that routinely we would send someone home. On a ventilator, we, but we actually be. did. Okay. I have from Duke on full vent. Yeah. It's okay. just because it's so rare for these kids to go home. And, and I will say, and, and this was 24 years ago, um, it was very rare to go home on a ventilator from Duke, and, and we had to fight to do that because it's in North Carolina, we just don't have the resources for these kids. Maybe you don't have like that. The home health care, you know, for kids on vent is a, is a whole different world. It's a whole different world. Yeah, the versus a feeding tube or something where, you know, a tube comes out and they literally can't breathe and they can't survive. So it, it's very complicated. Because we have so many rural areas in North Carolina and home health is so hard to find staff for anyway. And if you have a pediatric home health nurse, she typically gets all the pediatric cases in a very large rural area of North Carolina and so burnout is very very common among pediatric home health nurses so we, we have a hard time keeping a pediatric home health nurse who may travel you know 50 miles to take care of you know two patients in one day's time frame so and if something were to happen in a rural area and your baby is on a ventilator then how quickly can you get the care that's needed so I would say it's definitely not a routine thing so Anyone else have any questions? Thank you.